All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday media briefing on the COVID-19 incident. I'm Carrie Schutte. I'm a spokesperson for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. We appreciate all of you being here today. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our uh, all of our partners and um, ask each of them to give a quick update on what has happened since we last spoke with all of you on Monday. And uh, let's start with um, Chief Guvea from CAL FIRE. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Um, we're just progressing. Um, the uh, incident organization that was put in place uh, this over the week uh, has just been building and refining its plans. Uh, really a lot of the focus yesterday was on uh, contingency planning and long-term planning. Um, uh, Sheriff McGreeny and I had the opportunity to go before the board yesterday and talk in depth about uh, where we're going with the organization and, and how we're working with uh, HHSA and public health and each other. Um, also, um, we were able to uh, meet with uh, the incorporated cities yesterday and also share that same information so that we are all uh, moving in the same direction, sharing the same messages and uh, working together. Uh, moving forward. So uh, things are progressing nicely. Excellent. Thank you so much. Sheriff McGreeny. Yeah, just to echo everything that uh, Chief said, um, I'm proud of everyone and the work they're doing. Um, I feel very confident. Our whole IC team feels confident in what's been put into place and our direction moving forward. So with that, I'll pass. All right, uh, Don Al Eward, our Director of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, again, I want to thank Sheriff McGreeny and Chief Gavea for their support in our unified command. Uh, the command post is really moving along. We've been able to assign quite a few people there. Our whole county family has gotten involved in uh, this incident through um, the EOC. Uh, so we do have at least six departments with staff in the EOC, the county fire, the sheriff's office, the county administrative office, support services, health and human services, and probation. Uh, our IT department and public works were instrumental in getting the facility ready and continue to support us there. County Council, of course, is very involved with many of our activities related to procuring uh, services from various vendors through contracts and giving us other legal advice related to the incident. Uh, we've got a lot of cooperators from other outside the county. Uh, all three cities are involved with us. The County Office of Education and all the 25 school districts are participating and uh, many of them have provided us with school nursing resources which we're integrating into the um, EOC as well. Um, our hospital partners of course are vital and our have liaisons to our federal medical station and continue to co cooperate with us on uh, other matters related to uh, treating individuals who are infected with COVID-19. So we have, we have not only a count, full county response, we have a full community response to the incident and uh, this emergency operations center is facilitating that response and keeping us uh, working together effectively. I don't know if you want us to do the numbers uh, or if, if you've got the numbers, Gary, or if there's any update there. I do. Um, I can I can share those right now. We've got um, as of today, we have 23 confirmed cases, two of which were added yesterday. We've got 529 negative cases. Those are from private and public labs. And we had 70. I'm sorry, 67 yesterday. Um, we've got 18 people in isolation right now, 67 in quarantine, two who have recovered. And we have three um, deaths, unfortunately, as of today. Um, thank you, Donnell, for your um, report. Um, Matt Pontes, the CEO of uh, Shasta County. Thanks, Kerry. Um, I would just echo some of the things that were said earlier, and not to sound like a broken record, but there really is a whole lot of really good communication going on out there. I had a chance firsthand to see the facility and talk to some folks out there yesterday um, as uh, Chief Gavea and our sheriff 
indicated we had some good communication and good good interaction between our cities and our board yesterday. Um, we appreciate uh, Mike Mangus coming down and, and making sure that we got a lot of that on tape and, and get that information out to the communities as well. Uh, along that same uh, vein, uh, we had our um, expert, Jake Mangus, uh, there with us and helping to make sure that his eyes and ears are are in the business community, uh, which is such a vital role, um, making sure that those resources are getting out there to those business communities. And that if they have questions that, uh, that he is our hub uh, on that front. And, you know, I just also like to say that, you know, we've got a lot of folks on this. We've got a lot of folks in the community working together. And it, this really is gonna be a marathon as we make our way through uh, the, next, the next couple months. And, that this amount of work does take a toll on the community, on our staff, on the healthcare professionals that are out there, and that everybody just needs to remember to be compassionate, to be understanding, and to be patient with each other as we as we work long shifts and as we interact with the community and the community has questions and and uh, we just need to all make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're getting information out there as fast as possible. But everybody again remembers to be patient during this time, and we're going to get through this together. And uh, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel and. We will come out a stronger community. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your strong and supportive leadership. Um, I'm going to have our hospital folks introduce themselves, and then we'll have um, Dr. Ramstrom check in, and then we've got Paige Green, who's going to talk a little bit about mental wellness. I'll give some updates, and then we'll dive into media questions. Does that sound like a plan? Okay, hearing no objections. Uh, Mercy Medical Center. Hey, good morning. It's Robert Folden. I'm Chief Operating Officer here at Mercy Ready. So really, I think today I just want to speak to gratitude. So, you know, we've had many in the community that have provided donations in way of, of food for staff. Uh, we've had many people that came forward with masks or other supplies. We have several folks within the community 3D printing shields for us. Um, but today was kind of a special day in that we had our first I guess what we're going to call graduation um, from a patient who was here in the hospital and actually got to be discharged home. So that's a very positive sign from our standpoint. The other nice thing that happened early this morning was a, a shipment of supplies. So who would have thought we'd be we'd be happy about a shipment of supplies? But we got a large crate of of PPE. So that always feels good to see that coming in. And then from our standpoint, we're trying to create some more focus just around wellness. You know, we've got the Easter holiday coming up and that's usually a time when families gather and we, we do things that just might have to look different this year. So we wanna try and create some ways where folks uh, take a step back and, and look at the greater good that's within our community and within our, our workplaces. And that's it for today. Awesome. Thank you. I love the graduation. That makes my heart very happy. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Uh, Shasta Regional. Morning, guys. Uh, it's Mark Mitchelson, the Chief Nursing Officer for Shasta Regional. And for us, there's not many updates from Monday. Uh, just really looking at escalation and contingency plans as needed. And uh, I know somebody a couple weeks ago mentioned uh, the phrase poking holes in our plan. And we've uh, had a lot of staff members come to us uh, sharing what our plans are for these patients and just poking holes in our plans to make sure that we've really thought of everything we can. Um, and it's been very helpful to us to make sure that we really thought of anything and everything for the community in the hospital. All right, thank you, Mark. Uh, Mayors. Good morning, Mel. Good morning, um, I'm Valerie Lakey and I'm the Emergency Preparedness Director at Mayor's Memorial Hospital in Fall River Mills. And like Robert, we have too been focusing a lot on our staff. I think when we started this process a month ago, nobody really understood how long of a process it was going to be. So we see some dips and dives with morale and energy levels. So we're really working hard on that. And also just gratitude to our community, the same thing, lunches, masks, um, notes of support, and all of that means so much to our staff that is working just extra hard. Um, education of our community has been a big focus, trying to get them to stay at home and 
follow the rules. So we're working on that a lot. And then as far as just being prepared, we are almost completed with successfully um, converting space to meet what we projected our surge levels to be able to accommodate. So we've been changing things around and the nursing staff has been working very hard to get more rooms prepared. And we are going to use the um, space that used to be our ICU. That will be a place where we can have negative pressure rooms and we can house any potential patients there. So just a lot of extra hard work um, from our staff and we're just really proud of all of them. Awesome, thank you very much. And then Jennifer from Mountain Valleys. Good morning. Um, very similar update that we had on Monday. I noticed our CEO, Shannon, is on here, so she may um, have more to say, but we're kind of keeping the same protocols. We are screening patients at the door before they come into our clinics in Bernie and Fall River and all our other clinics as well. Um, we're also screening staff in the mornings and the evenings um, just to make sure that we're keeping staff and patients healthy. Uh, we received a 40-gallon donation from mayors. So we're just really grateful for partnerships right now and our community members are donating masks. So a lot of good things. And um, I'll defer to Shanna now if she wants to speak more towards what we have going on at Mountain Valleys. I think uh, the patient education and the just trying to get patients to be seen virtually instead of trying to have foot traffic in and out of our clinic. So it's hard for patients to understand that we don't want them in the clinic, but uh, we're making headway there. And uh, certainly having a, the ability to do electronic visits is, is really been helpful. Um, the PPE shortages are well known and community members are really stepping up and making everything from masks to gowns and uh, similar to, to other folks. So it's really um, nice that people are coming together in these hard times. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Ramstrom, do you have a, a check-in this morning? I do. Um, I First, I just wanted to say I love the theme of gratitude and graduations. And, uh, you know, I think that we all just need to keep remembering that our healthcare workers are out there, um, you know, taking care of all of us and um, potentially putting themselves at risk, even though they're doing their best to take care. Um, every day. And so um, also right there with you with a lot of gratitude for, for everybody who's pitched in in this effort. A um, couple of reminders I wanted to share today. Um, first is to please avoid all non-essential travel, um, particularly out of our county and back. Um, so, you know, for this would apply like, you know, if, if for people who have second homes in the area, they might be coming up um, from out of out of our region. Um, for those individuals, we ask that they just self-quarantine for 14 days um, when you arrive. Um, it's not ideal that uh, those individuals are coming in the first place, but if, if it has to happen, then that's what we recommend. You know, obviously you can go out to get your meet your basic needs, getting groceries and such, but um, that would be the safest um, strategy if, if that's necessary. Um, also, it's, it's just not the time to go on vacation. It, it just really isn't. And um, that presents risks to yourselves as you're traveling en route to your destination. Um, it presents risks where you are, um, the, whatever destination you're visiting, and presents risks when you re-enter our community. And so if that's something that has to happen, we ask that you take care on any return. If that's something that was essential travel that you um, really limit contact with, with anybody um, for those 14 days after return. Um, and that's consistent with the governor's stay at home order right now. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, we've talked a little bit about before is that the governor's stay at home order is in place. Um, we are benefiting from that stay at home order and that, it, that those precautions were implemented in our community earlier than it happened in some other communities. And so we are seeing, you know, our our, our cases um, are are increasing, but I, I really uh, I do feel that we are pushing that out, and as they've been saying, flattening the curve. And so I think we need to continue to do that. It's important to know because we are behind for a few weeks from other parts of the state that we're going to need to continue those precautions and some of those um, strategies to limit contact with others. 
um, probably for longer than other parts of other metropolitan um, areas in the state. And so it's just something so mentally and just um, emotionally for all of us to prepare for that as some of those things might be peeled away um, in other parts of the state, we, we might need to continue those for a longer period of time. Um, it's something that we've been, we're starting to plan for um, for our community. And so stay tuned for that. The other thing um, I just wanted to talk about testing. I know it's a, it's a, often a, a question that, that people have and it's been confusing because our testing strategies have changed over time as this outbreak has been evolving. You know, originally when most of the cases were out of the country, um, we really used exposure risk in international travel as a key variable when deciding to test. Now we're in a situation where we have transmission in our community and so that's no longer a criteria that is necessary to um, be met um, for testing. Um, it certainly, if that has happened, does increase the risk. It's just, but right now it's not, it's not required. And so anybody who has um, COVID-19 symptoms and, and particularly if you think that you're increased risk because you might have you know, been in an area for, you know, in some other part of the uh, region of the state for medical appointment or such, or um, you, for whatever reason, feel that you um, have had an exposure, then certainly um, that increases your our area, our um, uh, index of suspicion. But COVID-19 symptoms, it's important to contact your doctor if that's the case and have them assess um, what's going on with you. Um, it does not require um, assessment of exposure other than that at this point. And so um, we, we know that there's still um, challenges with the, with the testing capacity. It's very slowly improving. We're looking at multiple strategies um, to layer on top, you know, in addition to the commercial uh, labs that are testing. They're, they're still backlog, but their backlogs are getting better. Um, we still have challenges here and there with testing supplies that we're trying to redistribute to make those available where they're needed. We also have um, um, requests out and are um, getting some additional um, test kit supplies that we'll be able to share with community partners. We have a variety of um, other um, things in the works that other uh, companies are offering the same tests that we, that we do, that we're hoping to get those test kits and distribute them to community providers very soon. We have our name on the list of multiple point of care tests. And so we'll see, um, if we're a winner there. Um, and so a uh, lot of effort going into that. So we appreciate the community's um, 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 patience as that comes along. But I do think, and there's a lot of effort at the state level, there's now a community uh, a testing task force at the state level that's doing a lot of work directly with these test manufacturers. And so I think that that's gonna, um, we're gonna see some impacts of that um, soon. So thank you um, to everybody and, and um, hope you're taking care. Thank you, Dr. Ramstrom. Um, Dean Germano joined us. Um, Mr. Germano, do you have an update from Shasta Community Health Center? No, we're uh, continuing to do our regular thing. I just say, as far as the testing goes, it's still uh, taking anywhere from three days to seven to 10 days to get results. So uh, using Quest Labs. Uh, so it, we're seeing some improvements, but there's also exceptions as well. So. Um, that's the only thing I'll share at this point. All right, thank you very much. Um, before we um, introduce Paige Green, I just wanted to share a couple of updates from our Emergency Operations Center today. Um, the Federal Medical Station is still um, moving forward very quickly. There's a, a large group of um, Fantastic people who are working on that right now. They've been working on the processes that are going to be involved in that, um, bringing on staffing, all kinds of things. And so that you're going to see a lot of movement on that in the very near future. We're going to be standing up a four bed crisis stabilization unit. And that would be for people who are on um, mental health holds. They're called 5150 holds who are in the emergency departments um, waiting for a, a, a new place to go. Um, we'll be um, putting them in this crisis stabilization center to make uh, to make room for COVID patients and also to put them in a place that is uh, more appropriate than the emergency department. We've got um, our lots going on with housing. We're working with some hotels, contracts with hotels, with partnership from the Good News Rescue Mission, Hill Country, and Health and Human Services, as well as the, of course, Shasta County Housing Department to um, 
provide space in the event that a homeless person needs to be isolated or quarantined. That would be um, an option for them. And then we um, were very grateful to our partners in Shasta County Probation who have taken a leadership role on um, enforcement of businesses that are um, having difficulty complying with the, um, the essential services as governor's stay at home order. Um, and then I also wanted just to take a quick minute. I know that there's been a little bit of confusion um, in the public, which is um, expected. These are terms that, that we um, fortunately don't have to use very often, but to explain the difference between isolation and quarantine. Um, when we report the numbers of isolated patients and quarantined patients, isolation separates sick people with a contagious disease from people who are not sick. Quarantine separates and restricts the movement of people who were exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become sick and to protect other people from them in the event that they do become sick. So quarantined people have not tested positive. They are people who have had contact with someone who has. And so they're quarantined by our health officer um, as, as a precaution. And we, we check in, we, not me, our uh, communicable disease team checks in with them daily. Um, to make sure that they're still that they're still healthy, that their temperature is in a normal range, and all of those sorts of things. If anybody has more questions about that, Dr. Ramstrom, um, I'm sure can take those. But but there's been a lot of confusion about that just in the past few days with some some reports that have been out there that have been a little bit confusing. So we want to be sure that that people understand exactly what that means. Um, okay, so today we have um, Paige Green with us. She is the director of adult services for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency and she um, would like to speak a little bit about uh, mental wellness and, and taking care of ourselves during this stressful time. Paige, you're on. Uh, Paige, your audio is not working. Do you, it, you, the light is green. Mr. Pontus feels your pain. He had the same situation on Monday. <laughs> the light is green, but no audio is happening. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have um, I'm going to have Karen. I'm sorry. I'm going to have Kara give you the phone number so that you can call in, and then. Um, we can uh, oh is that you is that working now no no luck okay Okay, so we'll see if we can get that figured out. Um, we do have a phone number that you can call in. In the meantime, um, we can take uh, media questions. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I had a, just a sort of a housekeeping one here. Um, Robert's uh, graduated patient, is that a third recovered patient or is that included in the two? I do not know the answer to that question. Dr. Ramstrom, do you know? Um, since we just learned about it, it's probably not included yet, but we will we will confirm. Okay, so that's a possible third recovered patient then. Oh. It's possible. It, it's possible. We will we will confirm that. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Good question. Sure. Well, well, while I've got you there, Dr. Ranstrom, I've got a couple for you anyway. You mentioned that it looks like uh, perhaps in Shasta County we'll have to stay at home longer than other places in the in the state. How how much longer? Do you have any idea? It's a good question, and we are our epidemiologists are busy uh, modeling that data, um, and we I think it's something we're going to have to track as this evolves and. Um, you know, and, and it could change over time. The more cases we get, I think a little bit, there's a little bit more fine tuning and more act, uh, precision that we can um, use in the numbers that we see and the projections that we make. And so um, I think pretty soon we'll be able to share an initial prediction, but we're gonna have to revisit that as this progresses and um, it could change a little bit over time. So we'll see. Okay, and then one other question. The the two most recent uh, patients that tested positive, are, do you know if either of them are connected to that church or to the veterans home? 
Um, we are still investigating. Um, as far as I know, not the church. Um, and so the, the direct connection we're still looking into. That. Okay, thank you. Other question? I can't, I'm sorry, Mike, I can tell you that one is a close contact. Um, so that that's 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 how this particular individual, one of them was um, exposed to a direct contact, household contact. A, a direct contact to the veterans home? It was a household exposure, household contact, which is the highest risk group oh. really. And so, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? I know that Donnie has submitted some questions. Donnie, is your audio not working this morning? I guess we wouldn't know if it wasn't, right? <laughs> um, can you guys hear I me? I can try. Yeah. Never mind, there she is. Yes, I can. We can hear you. Can, you hear, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh. Yay, okay, sorry about that. Um, My first question was actually from a reader and she wanted to know, to her it was an unanswered question about the um, shortage of, um, of test kits. She said, is it about money? If so, the community could get money. Is it about um, resources? She was just frustrated and thinking there might be some solutions that the community could do to get testing kits. So we share um, the frustration. So thank you for the question. Um, it's not about money. Um, it is about a shortage of supplies nationwide. Um, the need to actually develop and produce all of the testing um, components that are needed for the different types of machines that are going to be running these tests. And so, um, and that's why there's actually a statewide task force um, that's been stood up in the last week to address testing because it's a complicated issue and it's a supply, it's a supply chain issue. And so um, our hope is that that coordinated effort at the state level is going to help make, um, distribute some of those, even some of those high throughput um, options, you know, throughout the state that maybe, um, I don't know, there'll be some connection to the commercial testing. I think there's just, there's a lot of strateg um, strategizing going on right now to try and address that issue of it's really, supply chain and getting the distribution of the tests to where they're needed. Um, it's not resources. We are actually putting out um, a lot of different um, feelers to identify um, kits, materials, supplies, everything that we can purchase and purchasing what we can. And so we're actually already doing that and have um, purchased some things, some supplies that we're going to make available and test kits we're going to make available in the outpatient setting. And so it's not resources we if it was resources we would just we would pay for it right now we'd figure out just like your caller suggested figure out how to make it happen but unfortunately that's that's not the only limitation <laughs> donnie did you have other yeah. questions oh. thank you oh steve um, okay sorry and my my oh. other question i had two okay i did i have two I had two other questions. Yes, please ask okay, that. Um, one is, I noticed in uh, Riverside and LA area, they are requiring residents. I'm trying. I don't think my audio is working again. I apologize. My audio you're, is you're... having trouble again. I apologize. Okay, we can we can hear you. Do you want to try one more time? Okay, so I okay. I do have the other I have two other questions. One is uh, in the LA area. Maybe I can try and answer because I have a feeling I think I know what her question is. Um, she may be asking about. Carrie, could you just read the question because I keep cutting in it. Yes, I definitely can. Um, let me find it. Um, the question is, masks are required for LA residents when conducting essential public errands such as shopping, but not for walks and solitary outdoor activities. Do you see Shasta County going that route? If so, or if not, why? 
It's a good question. I was actually was on the a call last night with several um, health officers and health department directors throughout the state, and it's it's a it's a topic of um, discussion and a variety of opinions and um, trying to come up with the best strategies. The state health department actually is updating and revising their current recommendations. Um, uh, the challenge is, um, I think, you know, communities are trying to do whatever they can, whatever they can, layering on different strategies to reduce the spread. And so that's what's happening. And that's that was the strat the uh, feeling, I'm sure, in those communities that have implemented those orders. Or others are feeling like, well, we don't really have science behind that. Um, there's concern that um, implementing a strategy that isn't really science based and that could potentially make people feel overly confident that would they would reduce physical distancing. Can that do more harm than good? Um, so I, I think that what where I am is I would really like to the, the state guidance is coming out with the new newest information in the next couple of days. We have our own thoughts about that, but um, I think then at that point, I really want to make sure that we're really promoting that information and helping people to understand what they can do for themselves in their individual situations to keep themselves um, the safest. And so that's where we'll be going. Um, and you know, I, I think the recommendation may change over time, but at this point, it would just be an additional recommendation into the physical distancing that the evidence is mixed, but the idea is that adding something, it can't hurt as long as you're maintaining that physical distancing and as long as we don't compromise the supply of medical um, masks. Thank you, Dr. Ramsterman. Donnie had one more question. We go over to Steve. I know Steve has some questions too. And that is, um, there's been a lot of North State people who claim anecdotally that they were ill in December, January, and February with an illness that had symptoms to what we know about COVID-19. Is it possible that COVID was present in our community sooner than we thought, and perhaps because some people may have already had it, that our numbers won't be high as feared? That's a good question. I think it will be really interesting and helpful once there's an FDA-approved um, um, and widely available serology test. Um, we're also interested in that question. Um, I think we're gonna learn more. Um, we're gonna be able to look back and we're gonna be able to learn a lot that we didn't know at the time right now. And so when that serology test becomes available, um, I think some of those individuals, you know, will be able to do that testing and they might have um, an answer. Now, by the time it's available, many of us, more of us may be exposed. And so it might be a moot point at that point at that stage because you don't really know when you were um, exposed but um we know there's circulation and uh i don't i don't have a sense that we have had enough circulation that it's going to cause uh provide us community immunity and so um i think it might be interesting on a case-by-case -case basis if we had that test available now but I, I honestly don't think that we have enough um immune people to really protect the rest of us all right, thank you, Dr. Ramstrom. Um, Steve, thank you for your patience. We are ready for your question. Uh, yeah, I have a question. First, a follow up to one of Donnie's questions. Can retail establishments require that their customers wear masks when they're in their stores? I don't know who, who could answer that question. I suppose any private business could require their um patrons to do what the business wants them to do because i wouldn't be surprised if that started happening but um my other question was um i understand that in in wuhan and and perhaps throughout china i don't know um everybody is required to have an app on their phone that uh, records their their temperature i don't know how the phone does that but uh, have you heard of that app and and is that app available in the states and should people be downloading that and and um and checking their own wellness on that Have, has anybody heard of that dr ranch so, um so um i've heard of a variety of different apps that actually sound pretty interesting um that i i have not seen available um in the United States or, or used yet. Um, and some of them actually that I've heard about are really more in development stage. So I don't know if that one that you mentioned with the temperature, that sounds really interesting. I also don't know how that would happen, but as far as the temperature taking, but um, it sounds interesting. 
the one app that I've heard about that I, I think um, once it comes along and not available yet to my knowledge is to help you identify if you've been exposed to somebody, which is an interesting concept just based on um, where you are, you know, because we all carry our phones so close to us these days that somehow you're you know, the kind of the mapping of where you've been might identify who you've been around. So we'll see. I think I'm hoping that other tools that like that come along, um, but but none that I'm I'm aware of in wide use at this stage. Others might know. Other questions? Okay, we're gonna give uh, Perry. Oh, go ahead. Perry, could I ask Carrie? Yes. Can you guys yes, hear me? Elena. Yes, Sorry, we sure can. I Okay. No, you're I'll fine. try to be ready. Pretty quick. Um, let's see here. So for today's numbers, um, you said 529 negative, and that's for both private and public, right? Oh, shoot. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, do you have a number for the total tests uh, given, you know, in the county? Yes, that would be 529 plus 23, which is oh, right. 552. Is my okay. math right? Uh, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> um, okay. And so then we just had, I was, uh, I was mostly just asking about that because we had a reader who was confused about the way the test numbers are shown on your website. Um, so basically, if they're that they were wondering, like, oh, how many people have actually been tested overall, um, both private and public, you know, public health lab. So basically, okay. the answer to that is that's just you add those together. Is that right? Correct. The number of positives plus the number of negatives equals the total number of tests. Okay. You just don't overtly spell it out. Okay, I see. Um, and then uh, let's can I just add so I I think it's important to keep in mind, though, that there's probably been a lot of other specimens collected, sent to labs that the results aren't in yet. And so oh, okay. it's probably an underestimate. Would that be counted in the pending category? We're, we're not going to be able to count it until it comes through and is reported through the public health system. Okay. Yeah. And the labs then... don't report until, until it's done. Oh, I see. Um, and then let's see, and one of those questions that I was gonna ask was already answered. Um, have you guys, I know you mentioned uh, the, the church the other day. Um, have you identified any other potential hot spots like that, that you know rise to the level of people need to kind of be on alert if they've been there? You know, we're kind of in the process of you know, as these cases come in, I think we kind of anecdotally, um, the investigators put some things together. We're in the process of trying to do that in a more systematic way. Um, but honestly, right now, all of us have to feel, all of us have to know that anywhere we go, we're at risk of exposure. You, you can't, you can't just, um, you can't really have a false, I'm worried people have a false sense of security. Um, if we were to just let everybody know, like, all the locations, it's really, um, it, it, it doesn't complete the picture. So um, we can't identify every single person who's pre-symptomatic and symptomatic and has a test, um, or even people who might be spreading, but we they're never gonna get sick enough to really feel like they even know to go to the doctor. And so all of those, all of those scenarios can actually pass it on to other people. And so, Making available that information, I I, um, I don't think is helpful. I mean, we all have to be really careful about anywhere we go that we're in the public and um, social distancing and limiting those kinds of errands uh, to basic needs, unless you're an essential worker, obviously. And then in that case, you need to take extra care all the time, you know, social distancing, washing hands. Did you I have any questions, Lena? Oh, I'm sorry. Go Oh, so, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, no, go ahead, whoever else is about to talk. Okay, I've got one for Eric McGreeny. Uh, since the Department of Corrections has a 30-day moratorium on accepting new prisoners from county lockups, how close is the jail to being full capacity? And are, have you reached the point again of having to cut loose people when new arrestees come in? 
And a follow-up would be, um, are bookings up or down since, uh, I mean, in the last few weeks? Good question, Steve. So as I um, indicated to the board yesterday, our bookings are significantly down. In fact, calls for service, uh, specifically to the sheriff's office, are 30% down. Um, our, our daily population, our, our percentages yesterday when I looked were at about 76, 77% uh, of capacity in the jail. So again, because bookings are down. And then specifically to your question related to CDCR, uh, they do have that 30 day moratorium where they're not taking any new inmates. So we have been tasked with holding on to those commits. And we are doing so, we are tracking that number, and we've actually, the State Sheriff's Association is working with the uh, Department of Finance. And I think um, I'd have to review some emails, have secured uh, some uh, funding for holding on to those inmates. So this hopefully we'll wait and see, obviously, but the state will be reimbursing the county for holding on to those inmates for the state. Thank you, Sheriff McCready. Elena, I apologize. I'm not giving you guys enough time to click unmute. Um, we're we're ready for your next question. Oh no, that's okay. I was I was kind of I'm going back and forth in my document where I had some questions, so I was kind of having my own issue. But uh, let's see here. So actually, I was one of the things I was going to ask was what uh, Steve just did. So that worked out. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We we're talking about the hot spots. Oh. Um, I actually had a question for Chief Govea, if possible. Um, I don't know if this is something you addressed recently, like maybe at the Board of Supervisors. I apologize if I missed that, but I was just curious. Obviously, like you guys are doing your thing, um, trying to offset any potential impacts to to your department and to fire response. Um, are you planning for like what would happen if you know if all of a sudden fire season comes along and this? issue is still ongoing and then there are evacuations and stuff like that like how would how would you handle stuff like that in a pandemic well thank you for that question um i think a couple of things our involvement um with um the sheriff's office and uh, with hhsa and public health um, is really in a support mode uh, for the emergency management and the organization um, trying to help support the overall um efforts with all of our departments. Uh, also, I wear the hat of Shasta County Fire Chief and, and County Fire Warden, um, and I sit on the Emergency Management Council here. So we do have a role in supporting the emergency uh, incidents in this county. Um, aside from that, from the Cal Fire perspective, we are looking at fire season uh, very heavily right now. Um, we are bringing on our first firefighters for fire season on Monday, the 13th, and we are uh, looking at all of the various challenges that we would face um, with large-scale fire camps, um, with our employees working in close proximity on fires, and how to minimize um, those exposures to our employees uh, amongst each other. Um, there is some large-scale planning for that, um, some contingency planning. Um, we have our, uh, our statewide incident commanders working on uh, how we would uh, create those separations at fire camp and try to uh, minimize those exposures. Thank you, Chief Gouvey. Uh, could I just, um, just I wanted to say, oh, oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, when you say that they're starting on Monday, is that um, like, is that, when do they normally start, I guess, is my question. And does that have to do with the weather or, or what, what predicts that time? It's pretty typical. There's, there's really uh, three staffing levels for Cal Fire in the state. Um, and it's done kind of on a statewide um, basis they do look at the north and the south um, as the south is t traditionally a little drier this time of year than we are but this year we're all kind of on an even kill as you can see the south's getting some rain right now that we saw over the weekend but um, we move into these staffing levels to uh, start gradually uh, an upslope to get to full staffing which is typically around july 1. so it is common especially over the last four, four or five years for us to bring our initial uh, staffing on in April, and then you may see additional staffing um, after that. Currently, we're planning on the next two levels of staffing to come at the first part in, of June and as well as mid-June. 
So um, it is a current staffing level. It'll bring all the CAL FIRE units in the state to um, one engine per battalion. So that for us would be seven engines here in Shasta Trainer Unit. Thank you very much, Chief Gouveia. We're going to try one more time to see if we can get Paige on the line. Paige, can you try one more time to talk to us? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yay. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to echo what people said earlier is I think this is um, going to be a marathon and not a sprint. And so for us to just remember, though, there will be an end and um, accepting that there are some things we can't change and some things that we can. And so the ones we can to um, try to be mindful of that um, for our own mental wellness. Um, and so kind of looking at it more positively um, and kind of looking at our attitude, how, how we're experiencing um, our day-to-day -day living um, and acknowledging that it's painful. The social distancing is very challenging, especially like mentioned earlier, coming up on this um, Easter weekend when families usually gather. Um, and so creating a schedule for yourself can, can really help that. Um, and for your family, that would include like physical exercise, 30 to 60 minutes um, a day of exercising, um, nutrition, making sure you're eating well, um, getting plenty of sleep, um, avoiding things like excessive alcohol, um, caffeine, um, sugar, um, and practicing some mindfulness. And even with mindfulness and exercising, there are some great videos, free um, apps um, online. And I saw that Jane Fonda even is renewing her um, exercise for um, the older population. So those are um, great things that you can do every day at home to take care of yourself. Um, and limiting your yourself and your family's exposure to the news, I think where you're hungry for information. And so sometimes we can overdo it and get overwhelmed with the amount of information. So limiting that for you and um, for your family and making sure that if you have children, not, um, you know, and helping them to manage their anxiety um, as well, not um, um, having them join in that. Staying connected to others. Um, socially, uh, making appointments a part of your schedule, scheduling in time to be social and connect with others um, is really important um, at this time. And if, if you're if you um, are not living with family members, being able to make sure you call them and talk with them regularly and then relying on the professionals to really give us guidance. And I know that sometimes there's mixed messages, but just really like this, being able to call the public health department. Um, in Shasta County and find out, you know, if you have questions or going to the CDC website, you know, just trying to um, let them make the decisions instead of us having to guess and wonder um, and then um, take direction um, from them. And I have some um, phone numbers for some hotlines that I'm going to give to Carrie so that we can put on our website for folks if they just need somebody to talk with. The state is um, trying to get up and running a warm line specific to helping folks who have, you know, questions or anxiety around um, COVID-19. Um, so that will be coming out. Um, calling 211 if you have any, you have questions about um, resources out there. And then a couple of handbooks that came out, um, the stress relief um, playbook for individuals and families. We'll be getting those links to our website as well. It has some really good information, some worksheets. Um, and then I think finally on the gratitude, you know, keeping a gratitude journal um, or even using that with your children. There are some really great free gratitude worksheets. Um, and um, the, the research does show that um, focusing on um, gratefulness every day does change the way that you think and in a more positive life so, light. So that's a really important part of um, remembering every day to practice. So that's all I got. Thank you, Paige, for that very um, helpful advice. And um, all of the resources that Paige just mentioned are available on ShastaReady.org. If you click on the link that says taking care of yourself, You'll find all of those things, the, the workbooks that she mentioned, um, the phone numbers, all of that is, is there now. And we're, we're adding new things to the website every day. Does anybody have any closing comments or questions before we say goodbye to all of you until Friday? I, I do have one. Um, okay. I, well, I, first, I wish I could limit my exposure to the news, but that's not working. But uh, I believe my question would be for Donnell. Um, 
Is there, uh, since the uh, uh, reports of child abuse are down and it's believed that that's because kids aren't out and about where people would see signs of abuse, uh, is children and family services increasing home visits to check on uh, on households where there's a history of child abuse to uh, to make sure things are okay? Uh, thank you for that question. We are maintaining all of our case management activities, <clears throat> although we're using the new tools, of course, that others are using. So we are trying to limit our employees' exposure to, um, you know, going out in the community. We're using the telephone and we're using these uh, cyber tools where we can do uh, video conferencing. We have a tool called um, Family Team Meetings that we do regularly to problem solve with families, especially around safety issues. And we've had better attendance at those since this crisis started than we had before because we've been using these uh, video conferencing tools and it makes it actually more convenient for people to attend. So we've had more participation. So I feel like we, we are on top of the case management piece for the cases that are known to us. Uh, our concern is a little bit more around detecting new cases or new allegations and because just because uh you know the folks who might see children who uh, might be in a precarious situation are not seeing those children as they would be normally we normally do see a decline in reports during the summer for example when school is out so we're just seeing that normal decline at, you know earlier in the year because school's out Okay, thank you very much. We are we are bumping up against the noon hour. I know we've got some folks that have places they need to be. So um, I thank you all of you for your participation. I know these these are running a little bit longer with our extra participants, but I know it's really useful to us to um, to be able to share um, your availability with our, our media partners so we get as much information out there to our public as possible. So thank you very much to our participants. Thank you to our media partners. We could not we do without um, you sharing um, thorough and truthful information with the public. So thanks to everyone. We will be back here on um, Friday morning at 11. Everybody stay safe and healthy. Have a good day.